Ugundu's heart pounded in his chest as he steered at the 40-foot drop below him. There was no other way across the ravine apart from making the risky leap across the 8-foot gorge. A safe landing on the other side would guarantee his escape for very few men, not even his agile friends who accompanied him on his daily adventures would attempt the daring jump and he felt sure his pursuers did not have the heart for such a dangerous escapade. There were several sharp rocks protruding from the sides of the gorge and Ugandu knew that the tiniest error in judgment or execution would plunge him into the gaping jaws of this abyss. The fate of those who had failed was well known in his village, and through the years the chasm had gained the infamous name of Sleeping Man's Valley. Ugandu had jumped the gorge twice before, but never under such frantic conditions. His survival depended on this very moment. Taking a few steps back, Ugandu readied himself for the jump. Suddenly a piercing cry rang out, Ugandu! Looking over his shoulder, Ugandu felt for the first time a terror that he had not felt thus far. What he saw chilled his heart even more than the gaping gorge before him. A young girl was running towards him with a wild look on her face. It was his younger sister, Adena. But how could she be here? He thought incredulously. Even more frightening was the realization that she was in grave danger of falling into the hands of his pursuers. She would never make the jump over Sleeping Man's Valley, and there was no other way out. Ugandu, they're coming, they're coming, she cried in a weak voice, falling at her brother's feet. She was exhausted, and Ugandu could see the deep scratches on her arms and face, evidence of her desperate run through the thorny bushes and shrubs. Adena, Adena, what are you doing here? Uganda cried, grasping his sister by the arm and dragging her away from the gorge. Adena's presence drastically altered Uganda's plan and made his escape even more improbable. Jump in the gorge now was impossible, but with some luck, perhaps they could forge a new path through the brush and by doing so, escape the horrible fate that loomed before them. But time was critical. Throwing a furtive glance behind him, Uganda thrust his arm around Adena's waist to give her support and to hasten her progress. All the children in his village had been taught to be weary of the raiding parties, particularly the Abam and Abriba of the Igbu clan, who were known for pillaging and kidnapping children and women. Some villages actually organized militia or age-mate groups who would act as watchmen or defense against the raiders. Despite the warning to be watchful, Ugandu and his friends found it difficult to always be on guard, especially during their weekly escapades by the river. There was no evidence of his pursuers as Ugandu hobbled along the path with his sister. There were hardly any places to hide long enough to evade his pursuers, and the path he was on led away from his village. He needed to make it back to the safety of the camp, but in his circumstance and with his injured sister, his options were meager at best. Ahead of him lay a thick patch of evergreen shrubs, a haven in this desperate moment, he thought. It was secure enough to provide a brief respite and a time to think of a way out of this terrible straits they were in. Pushing his way into the patch of trees, Uganda wondered how such a day of tremendous promise and expectations had ripened so quickly into disaster. His father had routed him very early from bed, making it clear that he should complete all his chores before dawn. Today was a special day, but he felt then as he often did the boiling frustration with his lot. 
stuck in the traditions of his tribal clan and facing a future that he was convinced would mirror his father's life. Ugandu pictured his father now as he huddled with his sister under the evergreen trees. His father was a tall man, even exceeding Ugandu's six-foot stature by some five inches. His face was not distinct in any particular way, but the deep lines around his mouth reminded Ugandu of the old trees with their rings of age, evidence that they had weathered many a season and had remained grounded. He felt sure that by now his father would be puzzled, maybe even angry at his disappearance. He had given Ugandu strict orders to stay in the camp, particularly today, the day of his imomuo, or initiation. It was a day of honor, both for him and his father, a day when he would leave his childhood behind and embrace his new position as a man in the Igbo tribe. His father had been looking forward to this day when his only son would make the rite of passage from a child to a man of great courage and honor. For Ugandu, it was a doorway to a life that would just be an imprint of his father's and grandfather's. He wrestled often with the frustration of doing the same things, hunting the same trail, following the same customs. His first venture with his friends to the coastline located about 12 miles away from the village had been quite an eye-opener for it was there that he recognized for the first time there was more beyond his camp. The thatched huts, the trees that he saw every day, beyond the boundaries that he knew so well. Since that discovery, Uganda's mind became restless with thoughts. What lay beyond the waters that seemed to touch the sky, he wondered. Often, he would sit on the sand and watch the eagles gliding effortlessly through the air, and each time he longed to soar like them, free to fly, high and far, unshackled by traditions and expectations. It was this burning desire to know more and be different that often landed him in trouble with his father. And once more, it was his impulsive nature that drove him to disobey his father's command to remain in camp today. But he had wanted to run with his friends one more time, as boys, one last caper at the river before bidding farewell to his days of frolic and leisure. Where were his friends now, Ugandu wondered? Were they huddled somewhere in terror like him? Or had they suffered a worst fate? An eerie quiet seemed to hang in the air, smothering the familiar songs of the wild. How much longer could he wait? He needed to get Adena back to the village. She was exhausted, and he knew she was in great pain. Why had she come to the river, he thought, a strange anger building inside him. He had just finished his dives into the river, when the desperate cry to run was made by one of his friends, a band of arrow men had discovered their playground by the river and were racing towards them with obviously evil intentions. In a frantic bid to escape with his friends, all of whom were on the riverbank, Ugandu scampered out of the river, not noticing the young girl skipping innocently along the river's edge in search of him. The slave trade thrived with the aid of the Arrow clan and their covert activities. Apart from their clandestine raids into villages at night, the Arrow tribe used other crafty methods to capture their victims. The Arrow priests would often urge the village folk to bring their conflicts to him to resolve. Those who lost their cases were encouraged to appeal their loss to a higher court and had to go to Arochaku town to have their appeals heard. Those who went were put through a long tunnel, and if they did not come out, were said to be guilty and that the gods had taken them. In actual fact, they were marched to the other side of the tunnel and sold into slavery. Tilting his head, 
Uganda listened carefully. Had he finally eluded the band of raiders? There were no more sounds of their feverish pursuit, but he had to be certain before taking his sister into the open again. Quietly, he eased his way out of the shrubs. Look like it's clear, sis, he whispered. Ugandu knew that he could not take her with him. She was safer stashed in the Kukunu shrubs for the moment. Stay here, said Uganda, peering at his sister through the leaves. I'll be back. Do not move or make the slightest song or we'll be caught. Do you understand? Let me come with you, Ugandu. I'm afraid. They will find me, I know. Please let me come. I can run, replied Adena. No, shouted Ugandu in a hushed voice. I'll be back. He could feel the familiar anger and frustration tugging at his composure again. Why was he now laden with the burden of saving his sister from this situation? Should they make it back to camp, he would be the one to answer to his father. Why were you at the river, Adena? He asked, unable to hold back the questions burning inside him. Why? Do you know how much trouble we're in because you didn't stay home like you should have? But Ugandu, it's, it's not my fault, started Adena. But Ugandu's anger could not be cooled by her halting reply. Of course it's your fault. You shouldn't have been here. Neither should you, Ugandu. Daddy told you not to leave, but yet you did. He was furious when he found you missing from your bed. And Granny said, run by the river Adena and get your brother before your father finds him himself. The news that his father was on the hunt for him filled Uganda with dread and some relief. It would be bad to suffer his father's wrath today, but it would be far worse to be captured by a band of marauders on the trail. Stay in the bush. I'll be back, said Ugandu, pushing his sister onto the shrubs. He needed to move. If he could find his father, perhaps together they could make it back safely to the village. Easing his way quietly through the bushes, he started back on the trail. Now his grandmother knew he had messed up as well. Oh, how did he fall into such a miserable pit? on such a high day. Suddenly, the figures of two men shot out of the bushes before him. Get him, cried one of the men, wielding a machete in his hand. Turning around, Ogando raced back along the trail, his heart pounding and his mind frozen in fear. He rushed past the shrub where he had left his sister, knowing that he could not stop to drag her along with him. He scampered down a short incline, knowing that he needed to go faster and find some way to slip the noose that was tightening around him. The ground was rocky and uneven, and suddenly he felt his feet stumbling, giving way beneath him. He flung his arm out, trying to grasp something to retain his balance, but Ugandu's desperate attempt to stay on his feet was futile. His body crashed into the ground under the weight of one of his attackers who pushed Ugandu's face into the dirt whilst his partner wrapped the chain of dried roots around Ugandu's hands. Get up, boy. You thought you could escape us, a foolish boy like you? <laughs> we'll get your friends too, so you won't be feeling alone at all, said the larger of the two men. <laughs> he sure won't continued the other man, his face contorted in an evil grimace. His left eye was just an empty socket and coupled with his toothy grin, it gave his face a diabolical look. Where are you taking me? What are you doing? Uganda tried to choke back the fear that swelled inside of him. Today, he became a man. He dare not cry and shame his father. As he stumbled along the trail in front of his captors, he wondered what would become of his sister. Would she make it back to the village safely? 
Surely she would have seen him being chased by the arrow men. No one really knew what happened to the boys who were taken, but some of the elders spoke of a big ship that took them far beyond the horizon. Ugandu felt a hollow aching feeling in his stomach as he thought of the possibility of being torn from his family. To be taken away from his village was terrible, but to be separated from his family, his grandmother, would be unbearable. He rounded a corner on the trail and there before him was a number of boys huddled on the ground, bound hand and foot. Let's get moving, shouted the man with one eye, prodding the young men on their backs like cows being herded or corralled. Ugandu looked intently at the faces of the boys, but could not see any familiar ones. Where were his friends? Was he alone? And where had all these other boys come from? With short, painful steps, they moved along the trail, stumbling under the restraints around their ankles. Some of the smaller boys began to cry and whimper as the party moved out. For almost an hour, they walked, and Uganda could tell by the position of the sun in the sky that it was well past noon. He wondered what his father was doing at that moment. Was he still combing the bushes looking for his son, who had now brought so much grief to his mother and grandmother? Ahead of him, the party had stopped, and Ugandu found himself staring down at the unusual sight of a bird fluttering feverishly at his feet. It didn't appear to have any injury to its body, and its wings seem intact. Yet its struggles to get airborne yielded little results beyond the rustling, restless beating of its wings. Too bad, thought Ugandu. Birds shouldn't try to fly until it was their time to do so. All the energy and eagerness was a waste of time and would land them just where this lucked out bird seemed to have ended up. A hard fall to the ground out of some cozy nest. Shaking his head, he nudged the bird off the path into the bushes with his foot. Perhaps it would get its wings going before too long and crest the winds with other birds that flew so effortlessly above the shrubs. Keep moving, shouted the man who was obviously the leader of the band of kidnappers, who now numbered ten in total. For several days, the party traveled with hardly any rest or ease from their bondage. Of the 30-odd boys who had been rounded up at the start of the journey, only 20 remained, the others having died from lack of water and the harsh conditions along the way. For Ugandu and his fellow prisoners, the journey grew increasingly worse as they made their trek to the coast. The kidnappers seemed to be in great haste and pushed the party harder and harder. Ugandu often wondered if his father was still on the hunt for him. He knew his father was an outstanding hunter and tracker, but the hours seemed to fade into days, and with the passage of time, his hopes diminished as well. Finally, the party arrived at the coast, and Ugandu's heart sank at the view before him. A large canoe laden with men and boys was making its way out to a large ship anchored about 200 yards from shore. Ugandu knew then his fate was darker than he had first imagined. The elders were right. The large ship had come and would take them deep into its bowels, away from freedom and a life of promise to one of obvious confinement. He would be taken. There would be no rescue. His father would indeed lose his child on the day of his initiation. But not to honor and distinction of manhood as they had expected, but rather to the chains and bridles of the slave traders. There was nothing he could do as Ugandu felt his body being shoved and pushed into the canoe. He was the last to board and he could tell by their actions the men were keen to make it off the beach quickly. He was sandwiched between two men an old man whose eyes appeared hollow and empty as he looked towards the shore, and a chubby young boy 
who hung his head as much to hide the tears that glistened in his eyes as to avoid the painful sight of leaving his home behind. Ugandu steered intently at the shore, his eyes fixed on the land, as if by doing so he could tether himself to it forever. He could not believe that he would not be here tomorrow, gazing out towards the horizon, wondering what lay beyond his field of vision. A coldness settled over him as the boat pushed off towards the big ship. The waters were choppy and every turn of the oars splashed the cool waters onto Ugandu and his fellow prisoners. Soon he realized that it was not the coolness of the waters that chilled him, but rather the realization that everything familiar and sure, everything he had grown accustomed to, the sound of his grandmother's laughter, the customs and traditions that his father loved and he had so often tried to ignore, the smell of his mother's cassava cakes early in the morning, would all soon be gone. Suddenly, something darted out of the trees onto the beach. Ugandu could not believe his eyes. A lone figure was racing along the beach towards the water's edge. It was a man, a tall man with long arms that pumped in a desperate bid to drive his body faster. But with every stride, his gait seemed to grow increasingly awkward, becoming almost a stagger as if he were drunk or overwhelmed in some other manner. To Ugandu, he seemed to be a man in deep distress. As he gazed at the receding figure on the shore, Ugandu realized there was something strangely familiar about the man. Indeed, the labored gait could not hide the familiar stature of his father. He had come, but the tide of fate and the tyranny of his captors now made it impossible for him to save his beloved son, Ugandu. As the canoe drifted farther and farther away from the shore, a loud piercing cry floated across the sea. Ugandu! It was his father's cry. A deep pain seemed to cut through Ugandu's chest as he strained to catch the fading image of his father. His eyes burned with tears that he dare not shed. Get up there, boy! The crude command jolted Ugandu into action. His party was being shoved up a rope ladder into the large ship. As he stumbled up the ladder, Ugandu caught one last glimpse of his father. He had fallen to his knees on the sand, his hands hanging limply by his side. Once on board, Ugandu and the other captives were quickly herded down into the cargo hold below. The putrid smell of filth and death hung in the air below. Men were crammed into every space in the hole, confined into two tiers of shelves with less than 18 inches between the shelves. They were chained together with the right foot of one shackled to the left foot of another. The space was so low and cramped that many of them were forced to sit or in some cases lie between each other's legs. The heavy shackles were fastened onto Ugandu's legs. Beside him was the old man from the canoe. Ugandu learnt that his name was Obialo and he had been taken from his village several weeks ago. He was a man of great prominence in his tribe and had been tricked by one of the Arrow tribesmen into leaving his village and sold to one of the slave traders who frequented the coastal towns. Over the thatchway stood a ferocious looking fellow with a scourge of many twisted thongs in his hand and at the slightest noise below, he shook it over the men as though anxious to use it. Days soon turned into weeks aboard the vessel laden with its human cargo. The unsteady motion of the ship combined with foul air and great heat added to the woeful conditions aboard the ship. Dehydration caused by the lack of drinking water and the high loss of bodily fluids from fevers and dysentery slowly had its impact on the men and women, many of whom succumbed to disease or some other deadly malaise. Ugandu could tell from the number of shackles that lay empty how many men had actually died from the wretched conditions. Daily, bodies were dragged to the deck and many did not return. 
His companion Obiello had been taken to the deck after fainting into the second week of their journey, and Ugandu feared that he would have been tossed overboard as had many others who had been gravely ill. But the old man survived. One of the most vivid experiences for Ugandu was the cramped waiting, tossing in the waves in the suffocating darkness day after day. Periodically, Ugandu and his fellow captives were brought up on deck and fed rice. Many, however, had no appetite to eat, but rather felt inclined to die rather than to face the uncertain future and painful separation from their families. Those who sought to starve themselves were routinely whipped and forced to eat. Confined in this hellhole, Ugandu thought often of his family. He remembered his mother who cried when she realized that he would soon become a man and would no longer be her little Ugandu. His grandmother, who favored him far above her other grandchildren. Looking over at Obiello lying next to him, Ugandu thought of his father. He knew that his father loved him despite the conflicts that they had had in the past. He understood his father's desire for him to continue the lineage of his family now more than ever. He had wanted to escape the constraints of his village, but now he longed for the feel of his father's firm grasp on his shoulder, rousing him from his cozy bed to attend to his chores. You think of your family, Obiello said weakly. He was in tremendous pain from the gangrene that had set in on his left foot. I have little to remember. My family was taken from me many years ago, so I know the pain of separation. Obialo's words cut deeply into Ugandu. The old man's kindness and empathy brought tears rushing to his eyes, and he fought bravely not to let them fall, though the heavy darkness of the slave deck hid every expression of pain and disillusionment. What awaits us, Obialo? Ugandu whispered. How do I keep thinking about tomorrow when I hate every day and even the thought of a future in bondage like this? You have been looking forward to your imamu when you become a man. But my son, the passage from childhood to manhood is not through a ceremony. It is through experience, as you will see. Remember your teachings, Ugandu. Everything is under the control of Chakwu, the Great Spirit. What he allows, you must accept, said Obialo. For the first time, his eyes came alive with what seemed like passion as he spoke of the Igbo's God. Ugandu had certainly begun to see the seasons of his life through his experience aboard the vessel. On many occasions, he had been forced to control the anger that boiled inside him as the slave driver used his whip with savagery and scant regard for those who were sick and dying. Igbu men were known for their rebellious nature, and Ugandu soon learned from observation that those who resisted were severely beaten and swiftly tossed overboard. Your name, Ugandu, means eagle of life, but you sound like a dove or pigeon. Where is the patience and strength of the eagle? said Obialo. You are too impulsive, hasty. You wish to fly before your time, to be the man you imagine, flying high, soaring, seeing new things and achieving more than what your past offers. You must accept the changes that are brought into your life, whether by stormy winds or gentle breezes. You must change. You must adapt to survive. But I have no choice, Obialo. Do you not feel the shackles that bite into your skin? We're nothing. Tomorrow, we may be tossed into the sea or whipped until we're dead. There's no future, Obialo. No life. Only death. Ugandu peered through the darkness, trying to see the old man's face. Did he not understand there was nothing beyond the horizon? Only the black waters that would soon swallow them both? When the eagle grows old, he has only two options. One is to die because he cannot hunt for food 
and eat any longer. The other is to renew his parts. To do this, he dashes himself against a rock and breaks his beak and his claws. He tears off his wings and waits patiently for a few months until he gets new wings, claws and beak. It takes time before he can take to the sky again. But when he does, he can fly high and hunt with new vigor. It is the rule of life. You must have pain, Ugandu, if you are to have life. But I am not an eagle, Obialo. I am nothing now. There was a strange long silence, and Ugandu wondered if the old man had finally fallen asleep. Ubialo, do you hear me? Go to sleep, Ugandu. You will fly when it's time to do so. The words of Obialo were riveted in Ugandu's mind. As he lay in the putrid matter around him day after day, he thought of the lessons his father had tried so tirelessly to teach him. Obedience, pride in his tribal traditions, traditions of customs, not ideas. Indeed, his amamuo had begun, but in the strangest and crudest of ways. Ugandu had lost track of time. They had tried to keep track of the days by numbering the meals they were served. But by day 40, they had lost all interest and the inclination to continue the effort. Over time, Obialo grew worse. One day, they dragged his limp body to the deck, and Ugandu feared the worst. Obialo's passage had finally ended. Get up! Get up before I rip you to the bone! The harsh voice of the slave driver jolted Ugandu from his troubled slumber. Around him, men were being routed and forced up on deck. With a labored effort, Ugandu made his way up to the top. Slowly his eyes focused on a strange land that lay before him. He stumbled down into the waiting canoe, unsure of what would become of him when he came ashore. Finally, the canoe was dragged up onto the beach and Ugandu looked with some trepidation at his surroundings. Men were being sorted into groups and shoved onto carriages. Everything seemed new, but for the coconut trees standing like sentinels, or rather silent witnesses to the scene unfolding on the beach. Two white traders stood bickering and gesturing as though discontented with their spoils. This cargo is for here, Barbados, my good man, not Jamaica, said a blubbery old man who was sweating profusely. We've been waiting for a long time for these slaves. You've been two months in your journey, and time is money. The cane fields are ripe and ready for these devils. Get a move on, and don't delay. As the carriage carrying him and other slaves pulled away from the beach, Ugandu pondered the words of Obialo. He knew his waiting period had not yet ended, but one day, he would fly again, with new wings and renewed fervor in this land called Barbados.